So um, I'm Yanis. I'm a developer at Vapor. I develop server-side Swift, um, active in, uh, in uh, open source development there. I'm the developer of Mongo Kitten. And um, Mongo Kitten is faster than C. It's not perfect yet. I mean, there's still a way to go. But Mongo Kitten is faster than C. And this talk is about async and how we're planning to achieve the last bit. But there's a lot of information on how to make your application more performant. And async is there to help. So what is synchronous? So normally, your code is synchronous. You write it from top to bottom. It executes in that order. And it doesn't, it, it stops. Literally, it blocks. Whenever an operation needs to happen, like you're calling the a payment service, uh, Stripe, you're processing a payment, or even your iOS app. Your iOS app is processing an HTTP request, an API. At this point, you're taking a few milliseconds, a few hundred milliseconds. It takes some time to process this, to send a request, to receive a response. And that's slow. So how slow? So if you look at these statistics, roughly, I mean, I estimated this. Localhost will take about zero milliseconds to perform your request, right? It does, let's say, 10,000 requests per core. Your VM might have a millisecond delay, 1,000 requests per core. This changes because a millisecond takes a millisecond of your processor. There are 1,000 milliseconds per second. So now your cap is at 1,000 cores, uh, 1,000 requests per core. And this changes drastically once you reach out to other foreign servers. OK? And this is important for both iOS and the server, which I'm dealing with. So one, sol uh, one way to solve it is more threads. You uh, have one thread that can run a request at a time. And when it's blocking, it will use that thread. So why not spawn more threads, right? More threads using, dispatch, uh, using a dispatch queue is pretty simple. And they will take over control at some point when one thread is, done, is busy waiting for, the, for the, the external source, the database, the API, and the other one will take over. But there are 64 threads per core, uh, per application, not per core. So one, one core, it might be a bit more efficient, right? You just spawn up more threads, and it can <laughs> handle 64 requests at a given time. Sounds like a lot, but it's expensive. You're fighting over a control. You're doing context switching. There is a lot of reasons listed here why this is not a good idea. And you're still having a low CPU utilization. And CPU is what your, your computer is doing. This is where you're, the meat is of your computer. You're processing stuff here, right? So solution number two, don't block. And what does that mean? You're relying on notifications. When you're not blocking, you're sending, you're sending a request to the server. And you're, it's basically like shooting a blanket, right? You're, you're shooting the request. You're not even caring where, if it's correctly arrived. The error will come later. You're uh, not even caring about if, um, when, when the notification will come. You don't care. But the notification will come. You're going to have to set up notifications, which is what the library should do. Uh, four cores means four threads, and one thread can optimally Keep out sending requests, doing receipt or re uh, getting requests for a server, sending out responses, and it will not take. It will use your CPU optimally. It will have a bit of overhead. It will add a bit of latency. But in the re in real practice, you're having you're going to be able to do a lot more work, regardless of the overhead, right? So the theoretical performance impact would be roughly this. Okay, you're going to have a bit of overhead. So let's say nine thousand nine hundred requests per second. But it's a lot better. OK. So async, as I explained, event-driven programming. Event loops is a part of it. Dispatch queue is an event loop. Uh, this means you're dispatching uh, tasks to it. And every task that gets dispatched gets, it it gets its turn. And when it's, when it's complete or it's st stalling, the next one gets its turn. That's an event loop. And it will get, an it will get a new task every time a notification happens. Uh, non-blocking, streams, these are all very common concepts in async. Non-blocking we just discussed, and streams should be relatively obvious, but we're going to discuss that later. So code impact, and that's an important one. Uh, your code is going to might suffer. It depends on the library you're using, but this is going to make it more complex. 
instead of writing code top to bottom like you're used here, setting up the, the notifications. When, when is this completed, right? So let's look at paper two. This is a synchronous example. Uh, we create a new route, a post route, in which we receive a request, and we extract the JSON, okay? And this is Swift 3, so yeah, you're gonna have to unwrap a bit. There is no codable. Eventually, we're gonna create a user out of this request. There is no checks in this example, and we're gonna save it, but saving it to the database, let's say the database on a different server, maybe in a different data center, is gonna take a while, right? So assume this is 50 milliseconds, now we're down to 20 registrations per second, so you're gonna need to scale horizontally. More servers, right? Paper three. It's, it's the same amount of code, thanks to Codable partially, but there is not a lot of difference, right? Because we're, we're spending more code in the struct and we're saving a bit on the decoding, but realistically, this is the same amount of code for registering a user. And this is, this is scalable. Okay, because you're, you're, you're waiting for a notification using map. Map takes uh, a future, uh, a future with a future notification. In this case, we're not receiving any data in the notification, it's just an empty notification. And we're returning the response, okay, this user has been saved. So, we're less dependent on external sources, we're having the same amount of code, it's much, much more performant and much more scalable. So why wouldn't you do this, right? So let's use it. Promise and future are at the core. Um, a promise is, the, is on the library, the, on the developer's end where you make the promise. For example, the database will give you a promise whenever you're asking for a user. The, the database will give you a promise with a user. In the future, you're gonna get either a user or an error. And the future will receive it, so it's the, an input and output principle. The input is the promise, the output is the future. This is how you use it. Seems pretty simple, right? Uh, oh. So delivering a promise is easy, you, you complete it or fail it. There is no magic here, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, and you can register error handlers or any handlers using then catch and map the map you saw previously. And these notifications will be executed in the order you registered them. Okay, outputs, oh, this is a bit, I think I missed a slide. So then there are streams. I should have added that slide in. Uh, <laughs> so streams are like a socket. Your socket receives notifications like incoming data, uh, it can output data, it's a bi-directional stream. One of these streams is an output stream. You output information like a socket does. Uh, in this case, the socket outputs information that it receives from the internet. And you can subscribe to these notifications with a flat map in this case. Uh, a flat map um, in this case will get a string. You, you will map the data to a string and it will map it to a print. The, the result will be mapped to a print and in the end all errors that occur, like the, the socket breaks get disconnected, will be handled in the error class. And this is async, it's not too complex. Input streams, uh, maybe I should scale this one up. Is it readable? Okay, so an input stream, this is how we define an input stream. We can send information there. Uh, socket is also an input stream because we can send binary data through there, or let's say an HTTP request, let's say you're talking to the database, we're sending the query there, and it's not too complex either, right? This is a use case in Vapor. We managed, oh, <laughs> broken example, again. I think I opened the wrong project. So um, this is a use case, uh, our Vapor web server. We set up, uh, we set up a, a TCP server which gets clients, right? It receives clients. And these clients are a notification. Um, a client, yeah, a new client is always a notification in our case. So this client, each client gets a request parser and request serializer. And the request parser parses the incoming data, so the client's information is streamed to the parser. Then the parsed requests are streamed to the application, your router. The responses that result are sent to the response uh, serializer and the serialized data goes back to the client. So now we're, we're full circle. And this is how we implemented an entire web server in a few lines of code. Okay, there's a lot behind it, but this is how we can manage it. 
Pretty simple. And that's the basic of async. So now I wanted to show you some bonus lessons that I learned whilst developing this, because um, async isn't all that matters. You can easily mess up performance. And in the end, this comes together with async. I'm going to demonstrate it. So lesson one, memory copies. I couldn't hold myself back on the async part. So memory copies are heavy. Uh, async is pretty simple, so that's why. And uh, yeah, so there are structs and classes, right? This is pretty basic information. Structs are copied, have no arc overhead. Classes have arc overhead, aren't copied. It's, you know, both are good in their own way. And cow, cow is awesome. Uh, struct plus a class, what do we get? This is like combining atoms, right? So a struct, refer uh, you're creating a class, reference it with the, the heavy data, let's say, a, a, me a megabyte of images. And you're putting this class in a struct, and you're checking if it's uniquely referenced. Uniquely referenced means um, whether there are more, there is more than one reference to this class. So if you're having, if you're creating a class with a megabyte of data and you're copying the struct around, now this megabyte of data isn't copied, just a reference to the class. Make sense? So let's say we want to edit images. We're checking for is done uniquely referenced. If it's unique, we can just modify it. If it's not unique, now we're gonna need to do something extra because we're gonna have to copy it. So lesson two. Memory copies. Memory copies are really important. So there is another quite common knowledge thing oh, called pointers. Pointers are copied. Pointers are reference types. You reference the data. There is no arc overhead. It's manually managed. And there is a trick around it, which I really like. Um, suppose you have a, buffer, a mutable pointer. A pointer is performant. You allocate data once. And let's say we're going to allocate uh, an entire TCP message, roughly, right? This is about us. This is about one message in our case, and we're allocating it. And then, when the classes, the data is not being used anymore, we're going to deinitialize it and deallocate it. So now we have reference type. It's efficient. It's manually managed, but it's not scary. It it might be scary because we're using pointers, but really, this is safe. Next lesson, lesson number three, reserve capacity. Reserving capacity is important because at some point you're gonna come across this. Um, let's say we want to store a million integers. Integer is eight bytes, so now we're having eight megabytes of data plus the array overhead, which is not significant. And this means every time we're inserting an integer, you're gonna have to allocate data, copy the, uh, allocate data, copy the old data, add the integer, Deallocate the old data. So this is two million heavy operations and a million insertions. That doesn't seem right. So let's do two heavy operations, one allocation, one deallocation, and a million light operations. This seems more sensible, right? In, in low-level code or even often access code like uh, Vapor's router, it's pretty high level how routing works in Vapor. But this is a lesson I learned because we were having we were getting a URI with a path, and all paths were separated by the component slash. And we were adding, we were scanning for the next boundary, so the next slash, forward slash, and this, this string would be, would be put inside of the array, right? But um, this didn't really work. I ended up getting awful performance. So I fixed it by reserving seven capacity because the URI is realistically never much longer than seven capacity, and we saved about 300% performance. On an often accessed line of code, of course, but it's, it's important. Reserving capacity is underused. Another lesson I like is lazy parsing. So lazy parsing just means procrastinating. Sometimes you get data, right? People hate, people hate procrastinating because it ends up not doing work. Computers like procrastinating because they end up doing work when it's necessary and not doing unnecessary work. So, an example. We have uh, lazy string stuff. We were converting integers to strings. And strings are pretty heavy in Swift. Everybody knows that we're trying to optimize the shit out of it. But it's not working. It's still slow. 
So let's try to fix this, right? So we're getting, uh, we're, we're getting an a buffer of integers, and this buffer of integers, let's say it's a million integers, need to be converted to strings. So we could just map it, we could map it to, uh, to, to its description, and now we're gonna have to, have to find our, our, uh, our application because it's really unperformant, but we're gonna make two buffers. One of them is, the, uh, is a cache with the strings we're actually using, and one of them is the original integers. So we're, we're not wasting a lot of memory because the, the, when it's not used, when we're not using strings, it's not allocated, it's nil. We're not using much data at least. And we can subscript it. We're getting the index. Uh, if the index is not nil, at the, uh, we're getting the integers index. If the integer is not nil, okay, this is probably a poor example if you have double integers, but not really even. Uh, you're getting the index of the integer. There is an equivalent one uh, index in the strings array because we, we repeated nil for the integers count. So now we're having two, identical, uh, two identically sized arrays, right? And by caching the information and lazily returning it, at this point we're saving a lot of performance if we're not using <coughs> the data actually. Plus, which I didn't realize when making the presentation, if we're having two integers at the same position, we're not converting it twice. So that's an added bonus. And specialization. That's one of my last lessons learned. Um, the standard library is not free. People need to write, realize this, but it's really tough. So what does it mean not to be free, right? Um, free means one, maybe no op, right? Uh, no, no op is free, and it's not virtually free either. A plus operation in Swift is an if statement even, because it's checking for overflow. Um, the, the standard library is also made to be generic. It's not trying to be efficient. It's trying to come, uh, come and meet you in the middle, trying to be fast but flexible at the same time. Classical example, is append, append is not free, but append, like we saw previously, append comes to the middle when you're reserving capacity. So how do we make use of this? Um, HTTP one is an example of how they designed a protocol that is not specialized and can, cannot be taken advantage of. So you cannot use compression easily with short or shortcuts. I mean, it's easy to make a shortcut, get slash HTTP point one, you're gonna find this in about a million requests per second, but you're not gonna be able to make, take advantage of this in compression, for example. This is 57 bytes, and when I zipped it, it did 0% compression, because it's, not, just not, it's just not effective. It's not gonna add a big bonus, and it's gonna cost performance on your CPU. And this is not compressed and serialized in 0.7 milliseconds. And let's take a look at HTTP two, for example, 24 bytes, 24 integers, and it's already compressed. And this serialized in 0.05 milliseconds. So it's, gonna, it's about 50% faster. Uh, 50, let's say 30% faster. This is a big improvement. So creating specialized algorithms in performance, uh, impor important scenarios for performance, it's gonna be a big win. And I think this is my last lesson. Performance matters. It really, really does. So let's have a look. Um, 0.1 MS. Doesn't sound like a lot of performance, but like we said in the async presentation, 0.1 MS means you're gonna be limiting the amount of times you can call this function on a single thread to one divided by 0.1 MS. So this is gonna be 10,000 requests per second. So if you're rendering a frame in iOS, this is not gonna be a big deal. But if the plus operator in Swift would take 0.1 MS, <laughs> you're doomed. <laughs> so the conclusions, it's not cheap. Performance is tough. Arc is slow. Everything is sad. But we can take, care, take advantage of a lot of things, and you should. And I added another slide for results, but didn't end up adding it. OK, that's the end. <laughs> so any questions? I covered a lot of topics. Hmm? Was it was I too fast? No, it was great. Okay, cool. Any questions regarding any of these topics related to performance that I thought were useful? Uh, any statistics on uh, Hmm? Any statistics on RxSwift? Um, 
I'm not using Rx with because I'm uh, cre I'm creating my own async layer for Vapor Tree. Um, but what would you like a comparison to, roughly? I can give you an estimate. Some impression performance-wise, basically. Sync versus async? No, in async scenario, of course, but I mean, does it add a lot of overhead or not? Async. So versus the performance. Oh, yeah. Um, the async performance is primarily in the allocations and deallocations of the context. So when you're setting up the context of your, uh, let's say you're adding the callbacks, right? Swift captures the current context. Uh, let's say you're, uh, you're, you're, reference, you're, you, you're having a, glow, uh, a function like, I'm going to skip a few slides back. Quite a lot of slides back. This. Uh, no. Yeah, this one. So you're adding a request parser and a request serializer. These are variables that we set up, right? So these variables, in this case, are classes, so it's not really heavy. But suppose this is a buffer of 10 megabytes, like the, or a, mega, a megabyte of images, like I, suppose, uh, like I proposed. Uh, it's going to have to copy these references all over the place through every context here. And it's going to check for allocate, uh, whether it needs to be deallocated if the references are empty. Uh, for structs, this is even heavier in many cases because it's having to copy around the, the information for, between every context. That's the heaviest part of async. Uh, if you're using classes and you're generally a bit more, uh, if you generally, generally apply my tricks, um, no, you're not going to notice a big impact. The allocation is the heaviest part and it's going to happen regardless, just at a different time. I think the impact is about it tops 1%. But the, way, the profit is a lot bigger because you're not waiting for external sources. Yeah. Any other questions? It's not about async, but about the performance. How would you, uh, um, um, what would you say about mirror, about reflection? Say? Reflection? Yeah, mirror. Uh, <coughs> if a lot of overhead or not. Reflection. I didn't try that one for a long time because we have codable. But uh, reflection is quite heavy because it's going to have to analyze the meta type. Hi. Um, well, first of all, thanks for the presentation. You went very fast, so I need to play one more time. <laughs> Sorry. To get completely, but it's very, uh, there's a lot of information. Yeah, so sure. So it's good. Huh? It's all recorded, so it's good. Yeah, yeah so you, can, uh, you can have it. My question one. is what they say in general that you, know, you should not prematurely optimize and one of the things is basically you are programming, you know, coding, you know, optimized. Me, yeah. All the time. Sure. How do you see that uh, standard recommendation that, you know, you should not optimize till the very last moment? You know? Till the very last moment, I completely disagree because in many cases, like sync versus async, this is going to have a huge impact on your code base. Uh, now, now I agree totally. This is very. This is going to have a. a yeah. Showcase. But in, in general, when you're, all, you're already, you need, to, you need to keep performance in mind from the start, right? Mm -hmm. So um, you're going to have to take into consideration whether you're going to go with an async or sync setup. And in many cases, in many heavier applications, you're definitely going to want for, uh, go, to go for an async setup. But um, in many, when, it does, when performance doesn't matter, you can probably think of that yourself. If you're going to have 10 uses per day, uh, don't optimize prematurely. It's going to cost more than it's going to gain. Mm -hmm. But if you you're getting a, if you're sitting here in this room, probably you have a use case that if you're right, you're here for performance information, and probably you're you're building an application that gets that needs to be f fast, processes a lot of data, maybe, or generally just needs to feel fast. Um, yes, you need to t take into consideration that performance matters, but don't overdo it like I do because. I, I'm working on a web framework, Vapor, right? Mm -hmm. Vap uh, uh, Vapor is very low level in some parts, high level in others. Save one MS on a low level part, and this is going to cascade to some other guy in, so in, the, in America having to spin up 10 other servers. I've seen it happen. And just saving one MS in some place is going to save him a lot of trouble. So that matters for me. And some of these tricks, you're probably never, never going to have to apply them. So don't premature, uh, prematurely optimize, but do optimize. There, it's, a, it's a bit of a gradient, right? It's complex. That's what I mean, yeah. But it's, uh, you broke all the rules, but this is uh, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Any, anyone else?
we have some uh, libraries we recommend for async bar programming. Like in slides, you seem to be using Bumskin, for example. Nope, I'm using uh, Vapor async, which is part of Vapor 3. And Vapor 3 is going to be released, yeah, sometime soon ish. I can't give an estimate because my boss is going to kill me, but uh, <laughs> not really. Um, but we're, gonna, we're, we're, close to, we're close to an alpha, and the alpha is very stable. It's way more mature than Vapor 2 is, but we just want to get things right. So we're using Vapor async here, and in the future, we're going to switch to the, uh, to the Swift server standards, which are also going to have their own. Uh, Yes, this is Vapor 3, which I'm demonstrating primarily. Which you're going to replace it with um, what? Uh, Swift Server. There's a <coughs> Swift Server Foundation-ish thing. IBM is trying to get up, uh, set up the foundation for the Swift Server. And um, yeah, they're working on it. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. But Apple is collaborating on it too. A lot of parties are collaborating on it. And in the future, when, they, when Swift itself gets proper async support, like async await, then Maybe that's Swift what we, hmm? Maybe Swift I think it's going to be Swift 5 personally, but let's hope. Uh, okay. I hope 4.1. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Any more questions? Okay. <laughs>